Hello everybody and welcome to the Stitch Ray the number 6. This is the epilogue for Blackbird and this is obviously the audiobook for it. Uh, the series is getting very interesting, I must say, <laughs> I have to say that, it's getting very interesting. Uh, and I, I'm, I want to see what's going to happen here. Uh, I'm, I'm very invested in this story. Uh, if you guys haven't seen the previous episodes or read the previous stories, then make sure you go and do that. I have a full playlist on my channel, so you can watch them all in order. Anyway, uh, yeah, here we go. Fazbear Fright 6, Epilogue, Stitch Wraith, whatever you want to call it. Here we go. Larson pulled his brown sedan just inside the gaping doorway of the abandoned factory. He turned off the engine and looked around. A murky twilight was beginning to slip down the mountains on the far side of the lake, threatening to swallow the remainder of the day's light. Larson figured it would be dark in about an hour. Looking in the rearview mirror, he noticed a couple security lights mounted on tall poles, standing like senators, uh, guarding the factory and the dock extending out into the lake beyond. Some of that light would make it in through this door, he figured, and he'd need the light if he didn't start moving. Get on with it, Larson commanded himself. Picking up his portable radio and tucking it in his jacket pocket, he reached for the plastic garbage bag into which he stuffed the evidence he'd purloined from the evidence locker. It had taken some fast talking to get it past the sergeant on duty. He couldn't explain what he needed the evidence for because he hadn't quite convinced himself that he actually needed it. His intuition said he did. His logical mind was laughing hysterically. Getting out of the sedan, holding the garbage bag, Larson looked around again. He waited and listened. Unless a situation was pressing, he always liked to take a minute to assess where he was, take it in, feel it. It wasn't going to require a minute to assess this place. In just five seconds, Larson had felt enough. What he felt was so strong it hit him like an invisible force and he had to grab open, he had to grab the open sedan door to steady himself. Larson wasn't sure he believed in evil, but if evil did exist, he'd have said it resided here or at least it was visiting. He cocked his head and listened for another few seconds. He heard nothing but the sound of cars passing on the streets beyond the building and a couple of crows cawing from atop a corroded shed about 10 feet from the factory's outer walls. Wait, was that a movement he'd seen? He look. He turned to look at a yellowed, dirty window in the shed. No, nothing was there. Larson quietly closed the sedan's door. The space he, ha he was in looked big enough for two more cars like his, and beyond it, another larger room beckoned. It was dim inside the old factory, but Larson could see well enough. He could hear too, and what he heard told him where he needed to go. From the far side of the expanse that opened up ahead of him, scraping and rustling sounds war warred with plinks, thuds and clatters. Someone was in there. Larson stopped and wrapped the plastic bag's ties around his, waist, uh, around his wrist. Once it was secured, he drew his gun. Extending the automatic in front of him, he crept forward. A whisper came from what felt like a few feet away just up ahead. Larson went rigid. Someone was close enough that he could hear them whisper. Why couldn't he see them? He took a breath, steadied himself, then strode to the edge of a huge room dominated by a massive blue trash compactor. The compactor contained a pile of electronic and metal debris. And next to the compactor chute, his quarry stood. A strange cloaked figure, Larson muttered. Yep, there it was. Larson pivoted left and right, trying to find the source of the whisper, but he was alone on a wide concrete platform that encircled the factory floor, alone with the strange cloaked figure. The figure didn't seem to care about Larson's presence, though. It looked to be sorting trash. It was emptying a large garbage bag. Larson watched gears, hinges and tangles of wire drop from the bag. Then he saw the bag let go of the distorted face of a fox wearing a pirate's eye patch. The disconnected arms of a fox followed, one arm ending in a hook. Foxy. Larson recognised the animatronic from Freddy's. He was on the right track. The broken Foxy and what looked like other robotic de debris slid down the compactor chute into the square belly of the steel beast. 
when the remains hit the sides of the compactor, the clang brought Larson to his senses. Stop, he shouted at the figure. The figure turned and took a step toward Larson. Larson raised his gun and squared his stance. Leave him alone, Jake said to Andrew. Jake had no sense of himself as an individual body now, but he could still act like one when he tried really hard, like now. He threw his non-existent shoulder into Andrew's equally non-existent chest, and the two of them began fighting for control over the animatronic container that held them. The animatronic lurched back and forth in what Jake was sure must have looked like a spastic dance to the detective who was pointing his gun. Let me take care of him, Andrew shouted. I, I can stop him. His choppy words reflected the effort he was expending, trying to wrest control of the animatronic from Jake. Andrew had already proven he could command it at least a little, because Jake hadn't taken the step toward the cop. But you'll hurt him, Jake reminded Andrew, shoving harder with his imaginary shoulder. Andrew grunted, then said, panting, We have to get rid of this stuff, or it will hurt more people. Jake concentrated and raised his imaginary hand. Yes, but not by killing someone else. Frowning and throwing every bit of his will into what he wanted to do, Jake was able to overcome Andrew. The animatronic skeletal hand came up and slapped the compactor's start button. Then Jake took a solid grip on Andrew and prepared to do what had to be done. Larson flinched when the compactor started. The sudden bass rumble and reverberation momentarily stupefied him. Then, in the quarter second he spent to process that, he got his next shock. The figure threw itself into the chute. From where he stood on the upper platform of the big room, Larson was able to see the endoskeleton of the figure land in the spinning, thrashing heap of metal. Immediately, the part started to, con to consume the figure as everything churned inside of the compactor. A metal press began shoving its way into the writhing mass of the junk. Larson started to run toward the chute, but the, sp the, but the press ploughed through the junk faster than he could cover the yards between him and the switch. It moved steadily, inexorably, through the twisted mound with a roaring screech that sounded like a crash between, oh my gosh, sorry, that sounded like a clash between a behemoth <laughs> and defenseless creatures wailing in their death throes. It looked that way too. So much of the junk in the pile were parts of robotic toys and animatronics that it was easy to hum humanize, sorry, I was going to say humanitize for some reason, humanize the pile and see it as a mass grave being defiled by the powerful metallic arm of a monster. All Larson could do was stand and watch the compactors destroy the parts that had made up the cloaked figure and everything it had been collecting. As soon as Jake and Andrew landed in the compacting junk, the baseball field returned to Jake's consciousness. He heard his dad laugh, and he tasted a fresh peanut, and he felt himself begin to float free again. Jake resisted, focusing intensely on the junk surrounding him. He couldn't leave Andrew. The memory was so strong though, even as he put all his attention on the junk, his dad's face and the warm sun buoyed him. Andrew, grab my hand, he shouted. Andrew reached up, as soon as he did, too, began to disconnect from the endoskeleton. Jake was so relieved, so thrilled, that he let the memory embrace him again. He and Andrew both began to move away from their physical confines, as if they were being carried by a sleek, swift sailboat toward that wonderful sunny day in the baseball field, but only for a few seconds. Then Andrew was tugged downward. He was being yanked toward the infected robotic parts below. No, Jake shouted. He tried to hang on to Andrew, but the force resisting him was so strong. Jake looked down. Below him, a bizarre presence of colour and movement was brawling with everything in the compactor, including the animatronic Jake and Andrew were in. This chaotic collection of muddy brown, dirty yellow and shocking red pulsed with rage. Come on, Andrew, Jake called. I'm trying, but I can't. Something's got me. Andrew called back. Jake felt like he and Andrew were being stretched between two forces. From somewhere beyond this dirty factory, the good feelings of Jake's memory boosted them. From below, density roiled around Andrew, keeping them anchored. Jake thought the density was Andrew's pain. Then he realised he was wrong. 
It had nothing to do with Andrew. Andrew, Jake said, there's something else in here with us. It's him, Andrew cried out. He sounded terrified. Jake focused harder on his memory. He ate a hot, salty peanut, and he looked into his dad's warm, happy gaze. Larson couldn't move. He was mesmerised by the compacting junk and by the inexplicable light rising from it. What was that? He realised he was still aiming at the crumpling, deconstructing stitch wraith and holstered his gun. He rubbed his eyes. Was he seeing things? It looked like a faint aurora borealis uh, was rising up from the convulsing junk. Yes, Jake cried. Andrew was breaking loose. Then, out of the nearly c fully compressed junk, the contorted but, uh, but identified shape of what looked like a burned skeletal man thrust upward, with ashy, uh, ashy see-through skin that revealed dried up but still quivering organs, the man-thing looked like a creature from hell. Its limbs broken and bursting through the cracked skin, its face misshapen, its torso twisted, the creature took shape while Jake watched. No way is this Afton. No way. When Jake saw the man's bones crack, fold, and reshape into what appeared to be rabbit ears, he yelled, Andrew, come on. Rabbit ears unfolded from the back of the creature's skull and stretched upright, and the creature heaved itself toward Andrew. Jake had hold of Andrew, and he was sure all but the just the tiniest amount of Andrew's essence was in his grasp, but the creature was trying to keep hold of his friend. There is no... What? Sorry, this is a big... This is like the big reaction I'm, I'm having to this story right now. This was... Okay, wait, ha we might talk about this in a bit, but that must be the room in 1280, right? Right? <laughs> AKA William Afton? Okay. No, Jake shouted. Jake focused again on his good memory, but this time it didn't loosen Andrew anymore. It must it just started taking Jake away from Andrew. Jake couldn't let that happen. He was going to allow Andrew he wasn't going to allow Andrew to be hurt anymore. Jake had to stay and fight. Blocking out anything good he'd ever felt, Jake anchored himself back into the animatronic. He faced the enemy in the compactor. As soon as Jake released his memory, the creature shifted its attention to Mike, uh, to Jake, sorry. <laughs> Jake felt the creature claw at him. It felt like he was being mauled and pummeled by a force filled with the never-ending need to inflict pain. But he didn't give in to it. Throwing everything he had into his effort and drawing on the paper of his memory, Jake turned himself into a massive bat of intention and he swung away, knocking Andrew loose from the evil that held him. Andrew, suddenly free, was sucked away, and he vanished. Jake, however, couldn't untangle himself from the relentless rabbit creature. He fell back into the seething junk and was engulfed in blackness. The trash compactor opened, and Larson watched it tip upward and disgorge its flattened mass of broken animatronic and robotic pieces. From above the compactor, what looked like a dying ember fizzled and fell back into the compressed junk. What just happened? Larson asked the room. It didn't answer. Larson shook his head and looked around. His gaze landed on a pot with two red flowers shaped like starfish. It sat at a, at, a, at a tilt against the upper lip of the compactor, unaffected by the pressure that had just smashed through the rest of the bizarre debris the figure had collected. <clears throat> Larson thought about going down the stairs to poke around the compressed junk, but he didn't see the point. Whether he was right or wrong about what had just happened, it was done. So he turned and headed back to his sedan. There, he dropped the trash bag he'd carried inside onto the floor next to the sedan. He wasn't sure what to do with it. He'd planned on using it as a way to communicate to the stitch race. But now, he leaned into his sedan and pulled out a mini tape recorder. The uh, stitch race appears to be dead, he said into the recorder. He felt like an idiot. Dead wasn't the right word for what he just witnessed, was it? And what exactly did he see? He took a breath and spoke into the recorder. I saw an animatronic endoskeleton with a doll's head and some kind of battery. 
wearing a hooded trench coat, putting stuff in a trash compactor and pulverising it. It also destroyed itself. I think the stuff in the compactor came from the Frasbear Entertainment Distribution Centre and also from the site where the serial killer, William Afton, the one notorious for wearing a rabbit costume, died. What? <laughs> we actually got William Afton's name in a Fazbear Fright book? Are you kidding me? Okay. He stopped the recorder and thought for a second. Oh, what the hell? He started recording again. I don't believe the ghosts. But after what I just saw, I'm not so sure about anything anymore. I mean, from where I'm stood, I swore it looked like the Stitch Wraith was an animatronic contraption. And there was some kind of supernatural light coming out of it, like a ghost. Like the animatronic was haunted by ghosts. Maybe the ghosts were the kids Afton killed, or maybe it was Afton himself. He stopped the recording and sighed. Who is going to believe any of this? Tossing the recorder in his sedan, Larson turned his back to the inner part of the factory and looked out through the exterior, opening to the lake. The sky above the mountains was tinged with the faintest hint of pink. Maybe he should take Ryan hiking the next time he got to spend time with his son. Behind the unsuspecting Larson, the compacted trash began to move, making a quiet rustling sound Larson didn't hear the junk rose from the trash compactor and began to arrange itself into an upright being. As it began to assemble itself, the being sucked in all the remaining junk and debris in the factory. However, it also rejected some of the waste. Just as it started to form, the vaguely man-shaped structure of trash shuddered for a second, and then it ejected part of itself. A, mu mu a, mu mutilated, <laughs> a mutilated mass of robotic endoskeleton and crumpled fabric spewed through the air and landed several feet away. When the rejected detritus, oh my gosh, there's so many weird words, uh, hit the concrete, it lay still. The rest of the trash from the compactor continued its transfiguration. It formed itself out of animatronic body parts, but not in any logical way. They were joining all hay haywire. Heads were being used as joints, arms as legs and legs as arms. A torso formed from the hips and chest and belly of three animatronics, but each part was put in the wrong place. Hands were inserted at random all over the structure. Woven through all these misplaced pieces were wires and gears, which created a lamp labyrinthine uh, circulatory system connecting hinges to gears and screws and nails to eyes and noses and mouths. With each additional piece clamping into pace, place, um, the miscreation stood taller and taller until it was nearly 15 feet tall. Then, looming over the detective, it leaned to the side and lifted a macabre macabre <laughs> head up to the neck made from shins the neck uh, oh my gosh the head like the rest of the being was made from animatronic parts fingers toes wires hinges within those parts two gaping black holes looked out at the world with pure malevolence and from the top of the unnatural structure what looked like two rabbit ears made of even more animatronic parts unfolded and canted forward. They were aimed right at the detective. Oh, 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 oh. oh, that was an eventful one. Oh, I love that. The worst part about this is that's the end for me right now, today. Uh, I mean, we're, we're getting the next part in like a week, but that's amazing. That's so good, okay. Why haven't I read, read these earlier? <laughs> Why? Um, like, this is the best part of the Fazbear Frights books now. Um, very interesting. We got William Afton's name in Fazbear Frights books. So he exists in this universe. So it's it, it might not even be a different universe. It's literally just people paralleling each other. Like, for example, uh, Pete in Step Closer um, might literally just be a parallel but not in a parallel universe. Like, Pete exists in the same universe as the game universe, but he's just a parallel to Michael Afton. Huh. That's interesting. That's very interesting. 
Or it is just a massive parallel and William Afton still exists in this parallel universe. I actually that might be that might be it. <laughs> but either way, I did not expect the man in room 1280 slash William Afton to be in the story. Wow. Okay, that was a big reveal. Um, and also he's making a, a like a massive rabbit structure animatronic thing. I uh, I wonder if that is who the arm is in the security breach trailer at the end. That's that's possible. I think that's possible. Anyway, um, I'm going to have to <laughs> leave that there. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy, then please do like and subscribe. The next part will be coming very soon. So uh, make sure you're on the watch out for that. And I will see you later. Goodbye.